Weird gaming trivia, a necessity for gracious living. Gaming history's tale is widely dominated by being told from an American perspective. And with the extreme success of Nintendo in the region, information and content covering Nintendo consoles in their homeland is pretty easy to come by too. Since the UK provides a large population of English speakers, you have a bit of our gaming history too, but what occurred outside the Anglosphere is a little less celebrated online. Like history in general when it comes to gaming story with life in somewhat of a bubble. It's always interesting for me to look at what happened elsewhere in the world. Each gaming region has its unique story and South Korea is as interesting as anywhere else. Even in the 8-bit and 16-bit era, Nintendo would be keen to try and crack this lucrative market. So let's discuss how they would try and fail. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Hyundai Super Convoy, which is definitely not a Super Nintendo. Everyone knows the American-centric story of Nintendo by now. US gamers would credit the NES as playing a significant role in revitalizing the video game industry after the North American video game crash of 1983. The crash resulted from the oversaturation of low-quality games and consoles, which led to a decline in consumer confidence. The NES arrived and introduced a fresh wave of quality games and a sleek design that attracted more console gamers than ever before before. Its Japanese counterpart, the original Famicom, was similarly dominant, quickly finding vast popularity due to its advanced hardware, improved graphics and sound capabilities compared to its competitors. Pair this with its strong and diverse library of games, with titles like Super Mario Bros, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid and many others, this 8-bit Nintendo machine was a world beater, surely. After all, these games offered engaging gameplay, memorable characters, innovative mechanics, captivating casual and hardcore gamers alike. Nintastic. Throughout the mid to late 1980s, looking at the sheer unit sales numbers, Nintendo had established itself as the most dominant gaming company on the planet, with the NES breaking records and becoming the best-selling console of all time. Between the NES and its Japanese Famicom counterpart, a whopping 61 million units would be shifted throughout its life cycle. Nintendo would be on top of the world. Well, kind of, at least. As impressive as this feat was, what is even more interesting and often glazed over entirely is that most of this success was only achieved in two countries. The Famicom sold 19 million units in Japan and the Nintendo Entertainment System sold another 34 million in the USA. Across the other 193 remaining countries around the globe, surprisingly, Nintendo only ever managed to shift a measly 8 million units. That household brand recognition Nintendo quickly established in some countries wasn't as prevalent in others. For example, as highlighted before, people only really started buying the NES in the UK as one clever executive decided to bundle it with the Hero Turtles game, an IP that British children were more excited about than Mario or Zelda. So what was going on here? Well, two significant factors really. Most countries didn't have a video game crash with a Nintendo console appearing like a white knight to rejuvenate an industry. Even more importantly, Nintendo didn't invest the same amount of money into establishing a presence in other markets. They essentially threw most of their marketing might at the United States in an effort that clearly paid off big time throwing less money around and conquering other regions with less straightforward distribution chains would be a more complex operation, especially when we consider that in many places people were already enjoying other hardware. Every country has its own gaming story, for example, we have looked at the Pegasus' success in Poland and the official Nintendo Samurai in India, but South Korea also has an interesting gaming past, but to fully understand this we must first look at their relationship with Japan. After the division of Korea in 1945, later Japan would establish diplomatic relations with South Korea, recognizing it as the only country with a legitimate government on the whole peninsula. The two countries have a lot in common. Geographically, they are both neighbors, enjoy capitalism, and are the two main allies of the United States in East Asia. 
Considering this information, it would be easy to assume that these two nations would be strong allies. However, since both aligning themselves with the West, the relationship between them has been rocky due to various disputes. So let's cover why Korea has been so salty about Japan recently. To do this, we must examine some of the disputes between these two wealthy nations. Firstly, there is the old chestnut of who should hold sovereignty over what. There was a spat over a small collection of islands known as Lion Court Rocks, an area that is valuable fishing grounds currently occupied by South Korea. Sovereignty over the islands has been an ongoing point of contention in Japan-South Korea relations. Secondly, for many years, South Korea demanded an official acknowledgement, a sincere apology and compensation from Japan for forcing Korea's women into sex slavery for the Japanese military during World War II. The Imperial Army literally treated women in conquered territories as spoils of battle. All of this is without mentioning all the other atrocities that the Japanese committed on the island, annexing it from 1910 to 1945 and suppressing pressing Korean customs, including even the Korean language itself. Shockingly, even though Japan surrendered in World War II and was forced off the island, they would not apologise for their actions until 2015. So, as you can imagine, things were pretty heated between the two countries during the 8-bit and 16-bit console wars. After World War II, in response to their previous occupations, South Korea banned any Japanese cultural imports such as music, film, literature and of course video games. In fact, this ban was not even partially lifted until 1998 and was not completely lifted until 2004. So with strange relationships between Japan and Korea and a full cultural trade embargo, some would consider it crazy that Nintendo even attempted to establish a presence in the region throughout the 80s and 90s. But money talks, and corporate companies throughout history have often worked through loopholes in these scenarios. Today, we have many Western sanctions on Russia to prevent trade in their region. Back in the day, the United States placed similar trade embargoes against Nazi Germany. This meant that during World War II, the Nazis lost access to importing the sweet nectar that was Coca-Cola syrup. This did not stop the German wing of Coca-Cola from being able to quench the thirsts of sugar-loving Nazis everywhere, as during this time frame, the German branch of Coca-Cola created Fanta as a substitute for the traditional drink. Since the creation of Fanta, Coca-Cola has been quenching the thirst of their consumers with this delicious Nazi beverage ever since. So the next time you have a sip of soda carrying that iconic branding, remind yourself you can only enjoy it thanks to the Nazis. So hit that subscribe button now if you did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh what? Come on, bit. Don't be that. Anyway, with this evil blueprint previously laid out, Nintendo would follow similar loopholes to allow them to sell products in a country they were not welcome in. To achieve this, Nintendo would partner with Hyundai to sell products under a Korean brand instead of a Japanese one. While you have likely heard of Hyundai today, you are less likely to know its history. So let me try and educate you. The Hyundai Group was formed in 1947 as a construction company which would later diversify into manufacturing cars, computers and other products. In fact, in 1986, Hyundai manufactured an IBM PC XT compatible, the blue chip PC. This was a popular platform in the United States and is one of the earliest examples of PC clones aimed at the general consumer rather than businesses. With Hyundai's success, the company was a logical business partner for Nintendo to work with when entering the region. So an unlikely Japanese and Korean partnership would begin. The first platform released by Hyundai was the Comboy, an 8-bit system. Interestingly, this system took the form of a Nintendo Entertainment System, which was designed for the US market instead of opting for the Eastern-orientated Japanese Famicom design. Whilst mostly looking like your average NES on the platform's lid, it reads Hyundai Comboy written in Korean. But despite it having a Nintendo Entertainment System Korean version emblazoned on it anyway, I guess they were 
were trying to fool no one. The system internally differs from the NES found in other markets, as it featured its very own lockout chip, which meant that only games purchased in Korea would work on the system. If you import any of the 42 NTSC games released in the region for NESs elsewhere, the games will not work on your system without further modification. So when was it exactly that the Koreans got the convoy? The Hyundai Convoy never saw a release in South Korea until 1989, when the platform sold terribly due to a glut of Famiclone systems that had already hit the market. If you have been watching this channel for a while, you will undoubtedly be more aware of the impact of these mostly Taiwanese and Chinese manufactured systems, but these were not the only barrier the Convoy faced. Today, South Korea remains a market where PC gaming is widespread, with gaming on home computers being the dominant way to enjoy the hobby back then. The Hyundai Combi essentially offered consumers no real purpose as they could play the same games in cheaper alternative ways. Also, from an ethical standpoint, by buying the pirates' products, Koreans would have avoided lining the pockets of Japanese businessmen who, as explained earlier, were somewhat trade enemies of the nation at the time. But that was the 8-bit era, so what about the 16-bit era? The Hyundai Super Convoy was next in line for launch, Korea's answer to the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom. This time, Hyundai released this platform in the form factor of the Japanese design rather than the ugly, blocky American aesthetic. This system features one of the craziest system ads I have ever seen, with the most ambitious crossover of characters I have ever encountered. In my lifetime, this is the only officially licensed product I have seen which features an animation combining Mario, Goku, Buster Bunny and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all happily singing alongside each other. It is a thing of beauty. You've got to celebrate our differences. As for this weird Super Nintendo variant, the Hyundai Super Convoy apparently plays all Japanese Super Famicom games. However, according to Scanlines16.com, they managed to count 34 games officially released in the region. Interestingly, these games' are box art and label art are almost identical to those released in the PAL regions. Even the box shapes appear to be the same too, so it is interesting that they chose to market the system using some of its Western attributes again. The Super Convoy is said to have sold much better than the original Convoy, which I guess does make sense, considering, as far as I know anyway, that Super Famiclones aren't really a thing. Hyundai did not need to combat a glut of pirate variants of the system the second time around. Apart from these two systems, there was also the Convoy Mini, which, as you can see, was very clearly a Game Boy and Hyundai Convoy 64, which is obviously a Nintendo 64. By the time of the release of the Nintendo GameCube, the nation's cultural trade embargo had mainly been lifted, so Nintendo did not need to use the Hyundai Convoy branding any further. In fact, if you look throughout history, game consoles globally are becoming pretty standardised no matter which region they are released in, and lockout chips have slowly become a thing of the past, all in all empowering the consumers with more choice than ever before. Still, I love interesting trivia from gaming history that shows that gaming is much more layered than most people think. Anyway, if you enjoyed this one, subscribe, then check out my old video on the Pegasus. Oh.